would like to welcome witches, wizards and muggles alike to this casual reading and commentary of the James Potter series, a story envisioned by George Norman Livett on what might have happened next in J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World of Harry Potter. James Sirius Potter is the title character, and the story begins at the start of his first year at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. This reading is eagerly gifted to you by superfans Jamie in Australia and Sarah Jessica in America. The James Potter series has also been produced in audiobook format by Matt Brown of Living Audio and narrated by the amazingly talented Just Sargent. Three related short stories are also set in the Wizarding World and available as storytime listens on this YouTube channel, Write Me Poetry. Links to these, as well as Mr. Lippert's other brilliant works, are included in the description of this video. And, and now, now, it's time to operate back into the Wizarding Universe of, of James, James Potter. Potter. Did you, when you read the Harry Potter books, and it said mm -hmm. that when George and Fred made the swamp in the, the hallway, mm -hmm. you know, it said that Filch had... Hunting. To Hunt them over. Hunting. I, I know what that is. Yeah, see, I, I just like had an image of him kicking them across the thing. Yeah. But it was like I didn't really consider how likely that was at the time. It just like that's just what I did. Punted them over. Have, okay. And then I kept reading and then later found out what it really meant. <laughs> had you never seen Mary Poppins, the original one? Well, yes, I have. With Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke. Yes. Yes. Hunting on the Thames. He's on like a ah. pretend, he's pretending to be on a boat with push pushing a, a stick moving the boat forward. Yeah. And he says punting. Punting on the Thames. Funny. I'll have I'm gonna I wanna look that up now. I wanna see it again. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to read? Sure I am. Oh I have uh, no I book. even got I'm got my reading. original book out for this one. All right. This is, this is this is the first copy that I I got. So, yeah. very nice. All the boys are on the front. Yeah, all the, all the boys, and uh, you got the uh the, the entrance to a place Something. we'll visit possibly maybe. <laughs> and, yeah. and on the back, I don't know if you can read that. Let's see. When by. It says, where by the light of a silver bright, I found the grotto keep. Oh, okay. Mm. We're going to find um, out what that means. Okay. James Potter and the Hall of Elder Crossing, Elders Crossing. Chapter 3, The Ghost and the Intruder. James awoke early. The room was silent, but for the breathing of his fellow Gryffindors and the whistling snore of Noah several beds away. The light in the room was only a few shades above night, a sort of pearly rose colour. James tried to go back to sleep, but his mind was too full of all the unknowns that he was sure to experience in the next 12 hours. After a few minutes, he swung his feet out of bed and began to dress. The halls of Hogwarts, while relatively quiet and empty, seemed busy in a completely different way this early in the morning. Dewy coolness and morning shadows filled the spaces, but there was a hint of busy commotion just out of sight behind unmarked doors down flights of narrow steps. As James moved among the corridors and past empty classrooms that would later be filled with activity, he caught secondhand clues of the house elf activity that had thrived in the morning hours. A bucket and mop still dripping, propped open a bathroom door. The scent of baking bread and the clatter of pots and pans drifted up a short flight of stairs. A row of windows stood with tap tapestries draped carefully out of them for airing. James mended to the Great Hall, but found it quiet and empty. The ceiling glowing a pale rose as the sky outside absorbed the light of the sunrise. 
James blinked and looked again. Something was moving among the semi-transparent rafters and beams. A grey shape flitted, humming a rather annoying little tune. James watched, trying to make it trying to make out what it was. It seemed to be a small, fat man shape with a gleefully impish expression of concentration. Against all probability, the figure seemed to be very carefully balancing tiny objects on the edges of some of the rafters. James noticed that the balanced objects were directly above the house tables, arranged at intervals and balanced so delicately as to fall at the slightest breeze. <laughs> B! The figure suddenly cried, making James jump. It had seen him. It swooped down upon him so swiftly that James almost dropped his book. Who spies on the spy? When he's planning his morning funsies, the figure sang annoyance and glee mingled in its voice. Oh, James said, sighing, I know you. Dad mum told me about you, Peeves. And I know you, little crumpet, Peeves announced merrily, looping around James. Little potter boy, James. Ooh, sneaking about early, early, unlike your daddy. He preferred the night. He did. Seeking a spot of breakfast, is we? Oh, so sorry. All the little elfy wealthies are still cooking it up in the basement. Hogwarts belongs only to Peeves this early. Care for a Peruvian ballistic bean instead? <laughs> Peeves shoved a wispy arm towards James's face. The tiny objects filling Peeves's hand looked like dried kidney beans. No thanks. I'll I'll be off then. James hooked a thumb over his shoulder and began to back away. Shoesy, are we? Hmm, beans, beans, the magical fruit. Peeves dismissed James and swooped back up the rafters again. The more I plant, the more you to toot. Tooty fruits in Little Potter's pumpkin juice, perhaps. He cackled merrily. <laughs> James wondered until he was out of earshot of Peeves's singing. After, after a few minutes, he found himself on a long pillared balcony overlooking the school grounds. Mist arose from the lake in a great golden cloud, burning off in the sun. James leaned against a railing, soaking up the happiness and excitement of beginning his first day. Something moved in the stillness. James glanced towards it. It had uh, been at the edge of the forest near Hagrid's cabin. Perhaps Hagrid was back. James studied the cabin. The cabin. There was still no smoke in the chimney. The yard looked untended and overgrown. James frowned slightly. Why wasn't Hagrid back yet? He knew that the half-giant had a notorious soft spot for beasts and monsters, and he worried, along with his parents, that this would eventually be his undoing. Perhaps the alliance with the giants, tentative at the best of times, had fallen apart. Perhaps they had attacked Hagrid and Grawp, or imprisoned them somehow, perhaps. The movement caught James's eye again. Just behind the stack of firewood by, by Hagrid's cabin, there was a flicker of colour and a flash. James squinted, leaning as far over the balcony railing as he could. There it was again. A head peered over the firewood. In the distance, James could only see that it was a man about his dad's age. The face seemed to study the grounds and then the man stood slowly and raised a camera. The flash came again as the man took a picture of the castle. James was about to go find someone to tell about this strange sight, a teacher, or even a house elf, when something flew suddenly past him. James jumped aside, dropping his books for certain this time. The figure was white, semi-transparent, and utterly silent. It streamed past him, and swooped down to the ground below, aiming for the interloper with the camera. The ghost form, the ghostly form was indistinct in the brightening sunlight, but the interloper saw it coming as if he had expected it. The man let out a little shriek of fear, but didn't run, despite the fact that at least part of him seemed to want to. Jerkily, he raised the camera again, and snapped off a few quick shots of the ghostly form as it streaked towards him. Finally, just as the form was about to overtake him, 
the man spun on his heels and sprinted cl clumsily into the perimeter of the woods, disappearing into the darkness within. The ghost pulled up at the edge of the woods like a dog on the end of its leash. It peered in, then prowled back and forth restlessly. After a minute, it turned and began to, to return to the castle. As James watched, it began to take on somewhat more solid shape. By the time the figure had returned to the ground in front of the balcony, it looked like a young man. The ghostly man walked with a determined, if rather dejected, gait, head down. Then he glanced up and saw James and stopped. There was a long moment of perfect stillness in which the man stared up at James, his transparent face expressionless. Then the figure suddenly evaporated quickly and completely. James stared at the place where the figure had been. He knew he hadn't imagined it. Ghosts were as much a part of Hogwarts as wands and moving paintings. He'd seen the Ravenclaw house ghost, the Grey Lady, only the day before, gliding down a corridor and looking quietly morose. He was looking forward to meeting nearly headless Nick, the Gryffindor house ghost, but this ghost was new to him, of course. His parents couldn't have told him about every little detail of life at Hogwarts. A great deal of it was new to him. Still, the figure nagged at him, as did the sight of the man with the camera, sneaking about and taking pictures. Could he have been from one of the wizarding tabloids? Not the quibbler, of course. James knew the people who ran that publication, and they wouldn't be interested in the snoozing morning life of Hogwarts. Still, there were plenty of muck-raking wizarding publications always interested in the supposedly dirty little secrets of Hogwarts, the Ministry, and even James's dad. Heading back toward the common room where he hoped to find Ted or one of the gremlins before breakfast, James remembered that he hadn't yet given his parents' greeting to Professor Longbottom. He determined to do so at breakfast and to use the opportunity to ask Neville about the ghost and the man with the camera. In the Great Hall, however, Neville was nowhere to be seen. The long tables were now crowded, crowded with students in their school robes. So you saw some guy snapping pictures out in the grounds, Ralph asked around a mouthful of French toast. What's the big deal about that? I'm more interested in the ghost, Zane said determinedly. I wonder how he was killed. Do ghosts only come back when they've been killed in some really messy way? James shrugged. I don't know. Ask one of the older guys, for that matter. Ask ne Nelly, Ask Nick when you see him next. Nearly had this Nick, Sabrina said from uh, further down the table. Yeah, where's he at? We have a question for him. Gone, Sabrina said, shaking her head so that the quill in her hair wobbled. He hasn't been with us since our first year. Finally made it into the headless hunt after all those years. We had a party for him, and then off he went. He never came back. Must have been the thing he needed to finally move on. Good for him too. But still. The headless? Ralph queried tensively, as if he wasn't sure he wanted clarification. He never came back, James repeated. But he was the Gryffindor house ghost. Who's our ghost now? Sabrina shook her head. Don't have one at the moment. Some of us thought it'd be old Dumbledore, but no luck. But, James said, but didn't know how to continue. Every house had a ghost, right? He thought of the wispy shape that had returned, that had turned into the slight, silent young man in the front lawn. Mal call, Zane yelled. Everyone looked up as owls began to swoop in through the high windows. The air was suddenly full of flapping wings and dropping letters and packages. James's eye widened as he recalled Pease's strange project from earlier that morning. Before he could say anything, the first loud pop rang out and the girl screamed in surprise and anger. She stood up from a nearby table, her robes spattered with yellow gobbets. My mm. eggs blew up, she exclaimed. More pops erupted throughout the hall as the owls banked among the rafters. Zane and Ralph looked around wildly, trying to see what was going on. <laughs> Time to go, mates, James called, trying not to laugh. As he spoke, a Peruvian ballistic beam dropped from a rafter nearby landing in a half-empty cup and exploding with a loud pop. Juice erupted out of the cup like a tiny volcano. As James, 
Zayn, and Ralph ran out in of the milling chaos. Peeves swooped and dove through the Great Hall, laughing gleefully and singing about musical fruit. <laughs> Gotta love some peeves. Mm, definitely. Ugh. Technomancy class was held in one of the smaller classrooms in the levels above the main hall. It had one window immediately behind the teacher's desk, and the morning sun shone directly through it, making Professor Jackson's head a corona of golden light. He bent over the desk, scratching away with a quill and parchment as Zane and James arrived. They found seats in the uncomfortable in they found seats in the uncomfortable hush of the room, taking care not to break the silence by scrip scraping their chairs. Slowly, the room filled, few students daring to speak so that no noise could be heard except the busy scritch of the professor's quill. Finally, he consulted the clock on his desk and stood up, smoothing the front of his dark grey tunic. Welcome, students. My name, as you know, is Theodore Jackson. I will be instructing you this year in the study of technomancy. I believe a great deal in reading but I put great stock in listening. You will do much of both in my class. His voice was calm and measured, more refined than James had expected. His iron gray hair was combed with military neatness. His bushy black eyebrows made a line as straight as a ruler across his forehead. It has been said, Jackson continued, beginning to pace slowly around the room, that there is no such thing as a stupid question. No doubt yourselves have been told this. Questions, it is supposed, are the sign of an inquisitive mind. He stopped, surveying them critically. On the contrary, questions are merely the sign of a student who has not been paying attention. Zane nudged James with his elbow. James glanced at him, then at his parchment. Zane had already drawn a simple, but remarkably accurate caricature of the, ca the professor. James stifled a laugh as much as Zane's audacity as at the drawing. Jackson continued, pay attention in class, take notes, read the assigned texts. If you can accomplish these things, you will find very little need for questions. Mind you, I am not forbidding questions. I am merely warning you to consider whether any question would require my repeating myself. If it does not, I will commend you. If it does, I will, he paused, allowing the gaze to roam over the room, remind you of this conversation. Jackson had completed his circuit of the room. He turned to the chalkboard next to the window, taking his wand out of a sheath in his sleeve, he flicked it at the board. Who, pray, might be able to tell me what the study of technomacy entails? Yes. On the chalkboard, the words spelled out in neat, slanting cursive. There was a long, uncomfortable pause. Finally, a girl raised her hand tentatively. Jackson gestured at her. Call it out, Miss... Uh, forgive me, I will learn all your names in time. Gallows, is it? Sir, the girl said in a small voice, apparently thinking of Franklin's advice from the day before. Technomancy is, I believe, the study of the science of magic. You are of the Ravenclaw house, Miss Gallows, Jackson asked, eyeing her. She nodded. Five points for Ravenclaw then although I don't approve of the word believe in my car class. Belief and knowledge have little, if anything, in common. In this class, we will apply ourselves to knowledge, science, facts. If you want belief, Miss Delacroix's class will be convening down the hall in the next hour. He pointed, and for the first time, there was the surfacing of something like humour in the stony facade. A few students daring to smile and laugh quietly. Jackson turned, flicking his wand at the chalkboard again. The study of the science of magic. Yes, 
it is a common and sad misunderstanding that magic is a mystical and unnatural pursuit. Those that believe, and here I use the term believe intentionally, those that believe magic is simply mystical are also prone to belief in such things as destiny, luck, and the American Quidditch team. In sort, lost causes with no shred of empirical evidence to support them. More smiles appeared in the room. Obviously, there was more to Professor Jackson than met the eye. Magic, he continued, as the chalkboard began to scribble his notes, does not, I repeat, does not break any of the natural laws of science. Magic exploits those laws uh, using very specific and creative methods. Mr. Walker. Zane jumped in his seat, looking up from the drawing he'd made working at Uh, He'd been working at while the others scribbled notes. Jackson was still facing the chalkboard, his back to Zane. I need a volunteer, Mr. Walker. Might I borrow your parchment? It wasn't a request. As he spoke, he flicked his wand and Zane's parchment swooped up and wove towards the front of the room. Jackson caught it deftly with a raised hand. He turned slowly, holding the parchment up, not looking at it. The class looked with marked silence at the rather good character, caricature of Jackson and Zane. Jackson, Zane had drawn. Sorry. <laughs> Zane began to sink slowly in his seat as if he was trying to melt under his desk. Is it simply magic that makes a true wizard's drawing take on life? Jackson asked. As he spoke, the drawing on the parchment moved. The expression changed from a character of steely-eyed sternness to one of cartoonish anger. The perspective pulled back uh, and now there was a desk in front of the Jackson drawing, a tiny cartoon version of Zane cowered at the desk. The Jackson drawing pulled out a gigantic cartoon clipboard and began to make red slashes on the clipboard, which had the letters O-W-L across the top. The cartoon Zane fell on his knees, pleading silently with the Jackson caricature, which shook its head imperiously. The cartoon Zane cried, his mouth a giant boom, uh, boomerang of woe, comic tears spreading from, springing from his head. Jackson turned his head and finally looked at the parchment in his hand as the class erupted into gales of laughter. <laughs> he smiled of a small but genuine smile. Unfortunately, Mr. Walker, your subtracted five points cancels out Miss Gallows. Awarded five points. Ho hum, such is life. He began to pace around the room again, placing the drawing carefully back onto Zane's desk as he passed. No, magic is not, as it were, simply a magical word. In reality, the true wizard learns to imprint his own personality on the paper using a means other than the quill. Nothing unnatural occurs. There is simply a different medium of expression taking place. Magic exploits the natural laws, but it does not break them. In other words, magic is not unnatural, but it is supernatural. That is... It is beyond the natural, but not outside it. Another example, Mr. Um, Jackson pointed at a boy near him who leaned suddenly back on his chair, looking rather cross-eyed at the pointed figure. Murdoch, sir, the boy said. Murdoch, you are of age for apparition, I am correct. Oh, yes, sir, Murdoch said, seeming relieved. Describe apparition for us, will you? Murdoch looked perplexed. It's it's pretty basic, isn't it? I mean, it's just a matter of getting a place nice and solid in your mind, closing your eyes, and, well, making it happen. Then, bang, you're there. Bang, you say? Jackson said his face blank. Murdoch reddened. Well, yeah, more or less. You just zap there, just like that. So it is instantaneous, you'd say. Yeah, I guess I'd say that. Jackson raised an eyebrow. You guess? Excuse me. 
No, we're not supposed to guess or believe. We're supposed to know. <laughs> Murdoch squirmed, glancing at those, those seated near him for help. Uh, no. I mean, yes, definitely, instantaneously, like you said. Like you said, Mr. Murdoch. Jackson corrected mildly. He was moving again. Proceeding back towards the front of the, the room, he touched another student on the shoulder as he went. Miss Sabrina Hillgard, sir, Sabrina said as clearly and politely as she could. Would you be so kind as to perform a small favour for us, Miss Hildgard? We require the use of two... 10-second timers from Professor Slughorn's potions room. Second door to the left, I believe. Thank you. Sabrina hurried out as Jackson faced the classroom again. Mr. Murdoch, have you any idea what it is precisely that happens when you disapparate? Murdoch had apparently determined that abject ignorance was his safest attack. He looked at his, he shook his head firmly. Jackson seemed to approve. Let us examine in this way. Who can tell me where vanished objects go? This time, Petra Morganston raised her head. Sir, vanished objects go nowhere, which is to say they go everywhere. Jackson nodded. A textbook answer, miss, but an empty one. Matter cannot be in two places at once, nor can it be both everywhere and nowhere. I'll save our time by not taxing this class's ignorance on the subject any longer. This is the part where you listen and I speak. Around the room, quills were dipped and made ready. Jackson began to pace again. Matter, as even you all know, is made up almost entirely of nothing. Atoms collect in, a, in space, forming a shape that, from our vantage point, seems solid. This candlestick, Jackson laid his hand on a brass candlestick on his desk, seems to us to be a single, very solid item, but is in fact trillions of tiny motes hovering with just enough proximity to one another to imply shape and weight to our clumsy perspective. When we vanish it, Jackson flicked his wand casually at the candlestick and it disappeared with barely with a barely audible pop. We are not moving the candlestick or destroying it or causing the matter that comprises it to cease being, are we? Jackson's piercing eyes roamed over the room, leaping from face to face as the students stopped writing, waiting for him to go on. <clears throat> no. Instead, we have altered the arrangement of the spaces between those atoms, he said meaningfully. We have expanded the distance from point to point, perhaps a thousandfold, perhaps a millionfold. The multiplication of those spaces expands the candlestick to a point of nearly planetary dimensions. <clears throat> the result is that we can actually walk through it. Though through the spaces between its atoms and never even notice. <clears throat> In short, the candlestick is still here. It has simply been expanded to greatly, so greatly thinned to such an ephemeral level as to become physically insubstantial. It is, in effect, everywhere and nowhere. I love this class. It's my favorite. Makes me think yeah. of makes me think of when um Jane in the Thor movie, like the original Thor said, uh magic is just science that we don't understand yet. Yeah. And I like that. But it's actually that's a quote from someone from like nineteen twenty something, like a long time ago. Uh well, Alfred somebody. Go, go back a hundred years and talking on a phone could be considered magic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, this person is across the world and I'm talking to them. Yeah, I love exactly. it. Exactly. Talking, you know, it would be unheard of to talk to someone on the other side of the planet in real time, let alone seeing them face to face. Yes. <clears throat> oh, yeah, like kind of like we are. <laughs> exactly. Right. right. Think about it. The future talking to the past. 
Ooh. Think of it, time zones and everything, how I'm in, you know, uh, Tuesday morning and you're still Monday evening. Yeah. Oh, that's that's lovely. I like it. It's like yesterday <laughs> when you said, um, I said, when's the best time for you? And you said tomorrow morning. So I was thinking, okay, tomorrow morning is his right now. Wait a minute. I, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, <laughs> your tomorrow morning, which is my tomorrow night. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay <clears throat> Sabrina returned with the timers placing them onto Jackson's desk ah thank you Miss Hildgard Murdoch Murdoch jumped again there was a twitter from the class sir fear not my brave friend I would like you to perform what I suspect you will find to be a very simple task I'd like you to disapparate for us. Murdoch looked shocked. Disapparate? But, but nobody can disapparate on the school grounds, sir. True enough, a quaint and merely symbolic restriction, but a restriction nonetheless. Fortunately for us, I have arranged a temporary educational allowance that will allow you, Mr. Murdoch, to disapparate from over there, Jackson paced to the front corner of the room, and pointed at the floor to here. Murdoch stood and swayed slightly as he worked out what the professor was asking. You want me to disapparate from this room to this room, from over there where you are to here, this corner, if you could. I wouldn't expect it to be much of a challenge, except I'd like you to do it holding this. Jackson picked up one of the small hourglasses. Sabrina had Sabrina had bought. Turned it over at precisely the moment you separate. Understood? Murdoch nodded in relief. No problem, sir. I can do that blindfolded. I shouldn't think that'd be necessary, Jackson said, handing Murdoch the timer. <coughs> he returned to the front of the room, picking up the second timer himself. <coughs> On three, Mr. Murdoch. One, two, three. Both Murdoch and Jackson turned their timers over. A split second later, Murdoch vanished with a loud crack. <clears throat> Every eye in the room snapped towards the front corner. Jackson held the timer, watching the sand flow silently through the pinched glass. He hummed a bit. He allowed himself to lean slightly on his desk. <clears throat> then, lazily, he turned and looked into the front corner of the classroom. There was a second crack as Murdoch reapparated. In one remarkably swift motion, Jackson took Murdoch's hourglass from his hand and laid both his and Murdoch's on the table side, on their sides, on the, in the middle of his desk. He stood back, looking severely at both hourglasses. The sand in Jackson's hourglass was divided almost evenly between the two bulbs. Murdoch's hourglass still had nearly all of its sand in the top. I'm afraid, Mr. Murdoch, Jackson said, not taking his eyes off the hourglasses, that your hypothesis has proven faulty. Do return to your seat and thank you. Jackson looked up at the class and gestured to the hourglasses. A difference of four, sec four seconds, give or take a few tenths. It appears that apparition is not, in fact, instantaneous but and this is the very interesting part it is instantaneous for the apparator what can technomancy tell us about this that is a rhetorical question i will answer jackson resumed his pacing around the room as words began to scribble onto the chalkboard again around the room students bent over their parchments Apparition utilizes exactly the same methodology as vanished objects. The apparator magnifies the distance between his or her own atoms, expanding themselves to such a degree that they become physically insubstantial, unseen, immeasurable, effectively everywhere. Having achieved everywhereness, the apparator then automatically reduces the distance between his or her atoms but with a new center point, determined by their mental landmarking immediately before disapparition. 
The wizard standing in London envisions Abbott's field, disapparates, that is, achieves everywhereness, and then reapparates with a new solidity, solidity point at Ebbets Field. It is essential that the wizard make that predestin uh, predestination in his mind before disapparition. Can anyone tell me, using technomancy, why? Silence. Then the girl named Gallows raised her hand again. Because the process of apparition is instantaneous for the wizard, Partial credit, Miss, Jackson said almost kindly. Depending on distances, apparition takes time, as we have just seen, and time is not, relatively speaking, flexible. No, the reason that the wizard must firmly fix his destination before he disapparates is that while the wizard is in the state of everywhereness, his mind is in a state of perfect hibernation. The time it takes to apparate is not instantaneous, but because the wizard's mind is effectively frozen during the process, it seems to be instantaneous to him. Since a wizard cannot think or feel during the process of apparition, a wizard who fails to fix his solid solidity destination before disapparating will never reapparate at all. Jackson frowned and scanned the class looking for some sign that they grasped the, the lesson. After several seconds, a hand slowly raised. It was Murdoch. His face was a pall of misery as he uh, app apparently struggled to arrange the radical concepts in his mind. Jackson's bushy black eyebrows rose slowly. Yes, Mr. Murdoch. Question, sir. I'm sorry. Where? He coughed, cleared his throat, and then licked his lips. Where is Ebbetsfield? <laughs> I actually don't know where that is. <laughs> I actually don't either. No, I'm curious. Ebbet? Ebbet's field, like A B B O T? E B B E B B E Ebbet's field. Okay, uh, Ebbet's field was a major league baseball stadium in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, New York. Huh. It's an old baseball stadium. Brooklyn Dodgers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got that American answer faster than I did. Very nice. <laughs> All right. We just finished technomancy class, which is my favorite class. And we are beginning the next scene with James and Zane and Ralph. Yep. Here we go. Uh, yeah. James met Zane and Ralph after lunch, all three having a short free period. With too much time to head directly to their classes, but not enough time to go to their common rooms, they strolled aimlessly along the crowded halls near the courtyard, trying to stay out of the way of the older right. students and discussing their morning's classes. Right. I'm telling you, old Stonewall has some wacky magical effect on the passage of time, Zane told Ralph passionately. I swear, at one point I saw the clock actually move backwards. Well, I like my teacher, Professor Flitwick. You've seen him around, Ralph said, amiably changing the subject. So, Ralph. Zane was undeterred. Guy's got eyes in the back of his wig or something. Who'd have thought a school of witchcraft could be so sneaky? Professor Flitwick teaches beginning spells and wand work, doesn't he? James asked Ralph. Yeah, it was really excellent. I mean, it's one thing to read about doing magic, but seeing it happen is something else. He made his chair float, books and all. Books, Zane interjected. Yeah, you know the stack of books he keeps on his chair so he can see over the desk? Must be a hundred pounds of them. He floated the chair right off the floor with them still on it, just using his mouth. How'd you do at it? Zane asked. James cringed, thinking of Ralph's ridiculous wand. Not bad, actually, Ralph said mildly. There was a pause as Zane and James stopped to look at him. Really? Not bad, Ralph repeated. I mean, we weren't lifting chairs or anything, just feathers. Flitwick said he didn't expect us to get it the first time. But still, I did as well as anybody else. Ralph looked thoughtful. Maybe even a little better. Flitwick seemed pretty happy with it. 
He said I was a natural. You made a feather float with that crazy snowman whisker log. Oh, I totally went British on him. Okay. You made a feather float with that crazy snowman whisker log? Zane asked incredulously. Ralph looked annoyed. Yes, for your information, Flitwick says the wand is just a tool. It's a wizard that makes the magic. Maybe I'm just talented. Did that occur to you, Mr. Wand Expert, of all of, all of a sudden? Eesh, sorry, Zane mumbled. Just don't point that crazy snowman log at me. I want to keep the same number of arms and legs. Forget it, James soothed as they started walking again. Flitwick's right. I want to keep... <sighs> Forget it, James soothed as they started walking again. Flitwick's right. Who cares where your wand came from? You really got the feather to levitate? Ralph allowed a small grin of pride. All the way to the ceiling. It's still up there now. I got it stuck in the rafter. Nice, James nodded appreciatively. An older boy in a green tie bumped James, knocking him off the path and into the grass of the courtyard. He bumped into Ralph as well, but Ralph was as tall as the older boy and rather wider. The boy bounced off Ralph, who didn't budge. Sorry, Ralph muttered as the boy stopped and glared at him. Watch where you're going, first years, the boy said coldly, glancing from James to Ralph. And maybe you ought to be more careful who you allow yourself to be seen with, Deedle. He stepped around Ralph without waiting for a response. Now that's the Slytherin spirit you told me about on the train, Zane said. So much for I expect we'll all be friends. That was Trent, Ralph said morosely, watching the boy walk away. He's the one who told me my game deck was an insult to my wizarding blood. Didn't take him long to borrow it, though. James barely heard. He was distracted by something the boy had been wearing. What his badge say? Oh, they've all started wearing those, Ralph said. Tabitha Corsica was handing them out in the common room this morning. Here. Ralph reached into his robes and produced a similar badge. I forgot to put mine on. James looked at the badge. White letters on a dark blue background read, Progressive Wizarding Against False History. A large red X repeatedly slashed itself across the words false history and then faded out. They don't all say that, Ralph said, taking the badge back. Some of them say question the victors. Others have longer sayings on them that didn't make any sense to me. What's an auror? Zane piped up. My dad got called for auror duty once. He got out of it because he was on a shoot in New England, New Zealand. He says if ours got paid more, we'd get better verdicts. Ralph looked bewildered at Zane. James sighed. Ours, he said slowly and carefully, are witches and wizards who find and catch dark witches and wizards. They're sort of like wizarding police, I guess. My dad, the Nora. Head of the R department, you mean? A voice said as a group passed. Tabaka, Tab Tabaka Corsica. <laughs> Tabitha Corsica was at the head of the group, looking back at James as she swept on. But do pardon my interruption. The others in the group looked back at James with unreadable smiles. All of them were wearing the blue badges. Yeah, James said loudly, but rather uncertainly. He is. Your dad's chief of the wizarding cops. Zane asked, glancing from the depart departing Slytherins to James. James grimaced and nodded. He'd had a chance to read another of the badges. It read, Say no to our fear mongering. Say yes to freedom of magical expression. James didn't know what any of it meant, but he had a bad feeling about it. Zane suddenly turned and nudged Ralph with his elbow. Better get that badge on, mate, or your house buddies will think you've gone all soft on false history and the R.O. imperialists or whatever. James blinked, finally registering something Ralph had said a, mo a minute ago. Did you say that your roommate borrowed your game deck thing? Ralph smiled humorlessly. Well, maybe not him. Somebody did. Not that many people knew about it, though, unless they talked it up behind my back. All I know is it went missing from my bag right after I showed it to you guys. I suppose my housemates were just purging a room of counterfeit magic. He sighed. James couldn't shake the nasty feeling that was cooling in his belly. 
It was all wrapped up in the sugary niceness of some of the Slytherins and the odd badges. And now one of them had taken Ralph's weird muggle game device. Why? They were passing the, the Hogwarts trophy case when Zane, who had drifted ahead, called out, Hey, club sign-up sheets. Let's do something extracurricular. He leaned in, examining one sheet in particular. Read the runes. Predict your fate and the fates of your friends. Learn the language of the stars. Blah, blah. Constellations Club meets at 11 o'clock on Tuesdays in the West Tower. Sounds to me like an excuse to be out late. I'm there. He grabbed the quill, which had been affixed to a shelf by a length of string, dipped it the theatrically, and scribbled his name on the sheet. James and Ralph had caught up with him. Ralph leaned in, reading the sign-up sheets aloud. Debate teams, wizard chess club, house quidditch teams. What? Where? Zane said, still holding the quill as if he meant to stab something with it. He found the parchment for the Ravenclaw quidditch team trials and began to sign his name. I just gotta get on one of those books. I just gotta get on one of those brooms. What do you think my chances are, James? James took the quill from Zane, shaking his head in amusement. Anything's possible. My dad was the seeker for the Gryffindor team his first year. Youngest, seech, youngest seeker in team history. He's part of the reason they changed the rules. Used to be that first years couldn't be on the team. Now it's allowed, but really, really rare. James sighed his, signed his name to the bottom of the sheet for the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Tryouts, he saw, were after classes the next day. Ralph, you going to sign up for the Slytherins? Come on, all your friends are doing it. Oh, dang it. I did British again. <laughs> Ralph, you going to sign up for the Slytherins? Come on, all your friends are doing it. Zane leered at the bigger boy. Nah, I was never any good at sports. You? Zane cried heartily, throwing an arm rather awkwardly over Ralph's shoulder. You're a brick wall! All you have to do is park yourself in front of the goal and the defense is all shored up. All they need to do is find a broom that'll hold you, you big lug. Shut up, Ralph said, twisting away from Zane's arm, but smiling and turning red. Actually, I was thinking about signing up for the debate team. Tabitha thinks I'd be good on it. James blinked. Tabitha Corsica asked you to be on the Slytherin debate team. Actually, Zane said, peering at the debate sign-up sheets, Debate teams aren't divided by house. They're just random with teams A and B. Look, people from all different houses are on each team. There's even some of the visiting Alma Alarons on there. Why don't you go ahead and sign up, Ralph? James asked. Ralph obviously wanted to. I don't know. I might. Oh, look, P Peter's on team A, Zane said. He began to sign his name again. James frowned. You're joining the debate team just because Peter Morganstone is on it. Can you think of a better reason? You know, James said, laughing. Peter's going out with Ted, I think. My dad says girls don't know whether they like ice cream until they try it every kind, Zane said wisely, sticking a quill back into its holder. Ralph furrowed his brow. What's that mean? It means Zane here thinks he can give Ted a run for his money in the romance department, James said. He both admired and worried about Zane's lack of ambition. It means, Zane replied, that Petra doesn't know what she wants in a man until she's had a chance to get to know as many men as possible. I'm thinking only of her best interests. Ralph studied Zane for a moment. You do know you're 11 years old, right? James stopped as Zane and Ralph began to walk on. His eye had been caught by a picture in the trophy case. He leaned in, cupping his hands around his face to block the glare of the sun. The picture was black and white, moving, as all wizard pictures did. It was his dad, younger, thinner, his black hair wild and unruly over the famous characteristic scar. He was smiling uncomfortably at the camera, his eyes moving as if he were avoiding eye contact with somebody or something outside the camera's view. Next to the framed photo was a large trophy made of silver and a sort of blue crystal that glowed with a shifting, curling light. James read the plaque below the trophy. The Tri Wizard Cup, jointly awarded to Harry Potter and Cedric Diggory, Hogwarts students of the Gryffindor and Hufflepuff houses, respectively, for winning the Tri Wizard Tournament, which was held upon these grounds with the cooperation of representatives from the Durmstrang Institute and the Beauxbatons Academy of Magic. There was more, but James didn't read it. He knew the story. 
Harry Potter's name had been drawn as a competitor fraudulently, having been placed into the running by a dark wizard named Crouch. It had led to both Harry and Diggory being sent via port key to Voldemort's lair, resulting in the evil wizard's bodily return. No wonder his dad looked so uncomfortable in the photo. He had been under the legal age for the tournament and had been the, the superfluous fourth contestant in a three-wizard competition. He'd been in a room full of people who suspected him of cheating and dark magic at best. James glanced at the photo on the other side of the cup, the one of Diggory. His smile looked genuine and hearty compared to his dad's. James had never seen a photo of Diggory before, but it looked familiar nonetheless. He knew the story of Diggory, knew he had died next to his dad in the graveyard they'd been sent to, killed at the command of Voldemort. His dad rarely talked about that night, and James understood why, or at least thought he did. He sighed, and then ran to catch up with Zane and Ralph. Later that day, when James stopped in his room to swap books for his Defense Against the Dark Arts class, he found Nobby waiting for him, scratching the windowsill impatiently. James grabbed the rolled parchment off Nobby's leg and read it. Dear James, your father and I are thrilled to hear you're settling in well, as we knew you would. Your Uncle Ron says congratulations on becoming a Gryffindor, and we all concur. Can't wait to hear how your first classes, first day's classes go. Also, I hope you hear about this from us, from us first. Your father has been asked to go to Hogwarts for a meeting with the American wizards about international security and other matters of mutual interest. I'll be staying home with Albus and Lil, but your father looks forward to seeing you next week. Make sure you are eating more than pastries and meat pies, and be sure to get your robes and yourself washed at least once a week. That was a joke. Actually, no, it wasn't. Love and kisses, Mom. James folded the note into the book he was carrying as he ran down the steps. The knowledge that he'd be seeing his dad next week had left him with mixed feelings. Of course, he was excited to see him and to introduce him to his new friends. Still, he feared that the visit would also make the shadow of his famous father that much harder to escape. He was fleetingly thankful that Zane and Ralph were both muggle-born, and therefore relatively ignorant of the explo exploits of his legendary dad. As he joined the crowd of students filing into the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom, James saw another of the badges on a Slytherin's robe. Progressive Wizards Against Magical Discrimination. It read, he felt a sort of aimless sinking feeling, and then he noticed a newspaper clipping tacked to the wall near the door. Harry Potter to join International Wizarding Summit, ran the headline. Below it, smaller type read, head R to meet United States representatives during Hogwarts ceremony. Security questions prevail. Pinned to the newspaper clipping so that it obscured the photo of a smiling adult Harry Potter was another of the blue badges. Question the victors, it flashed. Come on, Ralph urged, joining James. We'll be late. As they navigated the crowded room and found two seats near the front, Ralph leaned toward James. Was that your dad on the newspaper story? James had assumed Ralph hadn't noticed it. He glanced at Ralph as they sat down. Yeah, Mom just wrote me about it. He'll be here beginning of next week. Big meeting with the Americans, I guess. Ralph said nothing, but looked uncomfortable. You already knew about it, didn't you? James whispered as the, glass as the class quieted down. No, Ralph muttered. At least, not specifically. My housemates have been talking about some sort of protest all day, though. Looks like it's about your dad, I guess. James stared at Ralph, his mouth open slightly. So that's what Tabitha, Tabitha Corsica and her Slytherins were up to, behind all the friendly smiles and speeches. The Slytherin tactics had changed, but not their purpose. James pressed his lips into a grim line and turned to the front of the room as Professor Franklin approached the main desk. Professor Jackson was walking next to him, carrying his black leather case and talking in a low tone. Greetings, students, Franklin said crisply. I suspect many of you have already met Professor Jackson. Please forgive the short delay. Jackson eyed the seated students from over his shoulder, his face like granite. Zane's nickname for the man did, se did seem rather appropriate, James thought. Franklin turned back to Jackson and spoke in a hushed voice. Jackson seemed discontent with what Franklin was saying. He set his case down on the floor next to him, freeing his hand to gesture minutely. James looked down at the case. It was only a foot or two from where he sat in the front row. 
Jackson was never seen without the case, which was unremarkable in nearly every way, apart from the fact that he guarded it so, co so closely. James tried not to listen in on the conversation between the two professors, which was obviously meant to be secret. Of course, that made it all the more intriguing. He heard the words grotto and Merlin. Then a third voice pierced the room. Professor Jackson, the voice said, and while it wasn't a loud voice, it rang with an air of understated power. James turned to see who was speaking. Madame Delacroix was standing just inside the doorway to the room, her blind gaze hovering somewhere over everyone's heads. I thought you might like to know that your class is awaiting you. You are always such a... She seemed to search the air for the right word. Stickler for punctuality. Her voice had a slow drawl that was somehow both French and Southern American. He smiled vaguely, then turned, her cane clicking the floor, and disappeared down the hall. Okay, and the pause. Slow drawl that is French and Southern. I know they're talking about Caucasian. Lu Louisiana. Louisiana, yeah. I think, Caucasian. um, uh, what's his name? Did you ever watch um, X Men Origins Gambit? Uh, no. I need to see. It, um, Gambit from X Men Origins. Okay, hold on. If YouTube can help me here. So like a a southern southern accent. I know French person speaking English with a. Right. Would you say? Uh, Hang on, let me see if I can uh, do it in, in my voice. Uh, Professor Gambit. Jackson, uh -huh. it was, uh, I thought you might like to know that your class is waiting for you. You are always such a stickler for punctuality. Okay, 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 yeah. Okay, all right, I think I got it. <laughs> Gosh, it's so hard to do accents that are, like, near me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, like Zane keeps going out to Britain. <laughs> like, sorry, dude. Well, it's it's that's easy to do because you know, James Harry Potter English. You know, you automatically get want to go to a British accent. Right, that's my um, whole my whole thought process. Yeah. Okay, I think I can do it now. I've I've noticed that if I watch a video of somebody talking like that, it. It's like it kind of merges into my head, and then I can do it. So it just listen me. to to Jus doing Madame Delacroix. Right. Yeah, I need to just listen to his chapter and then read our chapter. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. I'm gonna do like a big dramatic start. Da, da, da. Okay. <laughs> Professor Jackson, the voice said, and while it wasn't a loud voice, it rang with an air of understated power. James turned around to see who was speaking. Madame Delacroix was standing just inside the doorway to the room, her blind gaze hovering somewhere over everyone's head. I thought you might like to know that your class is awaiting you. You are always such a... She seemed to search the air for the right word. Stickler for punctuality. Her voice had a slow drawl that was somehow both French and Southern American. She smiled vaguely, then turned, her cane clicking the floor and disappeared down the hall. Jackson's face was even harder than normal as he stared at the now empty doorway. He glanced pointedly at Franklin and then dropped his gaze, reaching for his case. He froze in mid-reach, and James couldn't help glancing down toward the professor's feet. The black leather case had apparently come slightly open when he'd set it down. Its brass, its brass catches glinted. No one else seemed to have noticed except for James and Professor Jackson. Jackson resumed reaching for his case, slowly clicking it closed with one large knobbly knuckled hand. James had only a narrow glimpse into the case. It appeared to be stuffed with folds of some rich dark cloth. James Jackson straightened, picking the case back up, and as he did so, he glanced at James, his stony face grim. James tried to glance away, but it was too late. Jackson knew he'd seen, even if he didn't know what it was. Without a word, Jackson strode back up the aisle, moving with that purposeful, sweeping gait that looks so much like an old battleship under full sail, and then turned in the, into the hall without looking back. Thank you for your patience, Franklin said to the class, adjusting his glasses. 
Welcome to Defense Against the Dark Arts. By now, most of you know my name, and many of you, I assume, know something of my history. Just to get some of the obvious questions out of the way, yes, I am that Benjamin Franklin. No, I didn't actually invent electricity for the muggles, but I did give them a small push in the right direction. Yes, I was a part of the American Continental Congress, although for obvious reasons, I was not one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. At that time, I used two different spellings of my name, only one of which was known to the Muggle world, which made it easier for me to know which correspondences to open first. Yes, I really, yes, I realize my face graces the American $100 bill. No, contrary to popular myth, I do not carry sheets of uncut hundreds around to snip and sign for admirers. Yes, I am indeed quite old, and yes, this is accomplished through means of magic, although I assure you that those means are a lot more mundane and prosaic than many have assumed. Emphatically, no, I am not immortal. I am a very, very old man who has aged rather well with a little help. Does that cover most of the obvious questions? Franklin finished with a wry smile, surveying the remarkably full classroom. There was a murmur of assent. Excellent. Onward and upward, then. And please, Franklin continued, opening a very large book on his desk, let's avoid any is all about the Benjamins jokes. They weren't funny 200 years ago, and they are even less funny now. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! That was fun. I, I, I love that, that end of that, that part there, where he goes through, yes, I'm this guy. No, it's not how it's done. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, I was it's trying great. to make it as, as blah, 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 as possible. So, ah, that's cool. Let's see. Um, I can finish, I suppose, if you want. <gasps> yes, it's Hagrid. You have to you have to do Hagrid. You have a beard right now. You have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> have to do Hagrid beard. Hagrid with the beard. Okay. Yeah. And I'm just gonna listen. I don't want to. I don't want to be. So okay. wait, let me get my listening close. Okay, right. Crossing the grounds on their way to dinner in the Great Hall, James and Ralph were passing Hagrid's cabin when they noticed the ribbon of smoke coming out of the chimney. James broke into a grin, called Ralph to follow, and ran up to the front door. James! Hagrid bellowed, opening the door. He threw his arms around the boy, completely engulfing him. Ralph's eyes widened and he took a step backwards, looking Hagrid up and down. So good to have a Potter back in school. How's your mum and dad and little Albus and Lily? Everybody's fine, Hagrid. Where have you been? Hagrid stepped out, closing the door behind him. They followed him as he crossed the grounds towards the castle. Up the mountains, meeting with the giants, that's where. Gwarp and me, we go every year, don't we? Spreading goodwill and trying to keep them all honest for whatever it's worth. Stayed a little longer this year on account of little Gwarp is finding himself a girlfriend. Who, who's your mate here, James? James momentarily, James momentarily distracted by the thought of Hagrid's half brother, who was a full giant performing mating rituals with a mountain giantess, had completely forgotten about Ralph. Oh, this is my friend Ralph Deedle. He's a first year like me, Hagrid. Are you telling us Gwarp's in love? Hagrid grew <laughs> vaguely misty. Oh, it's sweet to see the little fella and his lady friend together. Why, they're both just as happy as a pair of hippogriffs in the henhouse. Giant courtships are very delicate things, you know. Ralph was having some difficulty keeping up the conversation. Gwarp, your brother, is a giant? Well, sure, Hagrid boomed happily. He's only a little one, 16 feet or so. You should see his lady friend. She's from the Crestweller tribe. 22 feet if she's an inch. Not my type of girl, of course, but Gorp is just smitten with her. Not surprising, really, since the first step in any giant courtship is smiting the mate over the head with a big hunk of tree trunk. She laid the little fella right out cold for the best part of the day. After that, he's been as Google-eyed as a pop. James asked, was afraid to ask and suspected he knew the answer. Did Gwarp bring his girlfriend back home with him? Hagrid looked taken back. Well, sure he did. 
This is his home now, isn't it? He'll make a good wife of her once they're done a courting. She's made herself a nice little hovel up in the hills behind the trees. Gorp's there now, helping her settle in, I expect. James tried to imagine Gorp helping a 22-foot giantess settle in, but his, exha- but his exhausted imagination shut down. He shook his head, attempting to clear it. I hear your dad's coming in for a meeting next week, James, Hagrid said, as they entered the shadow of the main gates. Having a meeting of the mines with the muckety-mucks from across the pond, eh? James puzzled over Hagrid's terminology. If you say so. Ah, uh, it'll be nice to have your dad for tea over for tea again, just like old times, only without the secrecy and adventure. Did I tell you about the time your dad and Bron and Hermione helped my Norbert escape? Only about a hundred times, Hagrid. James laughed, pulling open the door of the Great Hall. But don't worry, it changes a little every time I hear it. Later, when dinner was... <clears throat> <clears throat> One sec. Breathe, man. Breathe. <laughs> Bloody biscuit. <laughs> okay, my eyes were like burning, so I need to wipe them anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. <sighs> You're doing an excellent haggard, by the way. I'm loving it. Thank you. Later, when dinner was almost over, James approached Hagrid where he thought they could have a more private conversation. Hagrid, can I ask you a sort of official question? Uh, Of course you can. I can't guarantee I'll know the answer, but I'll do my best. James glanced around and saw Ralph sitting in the Slytherin table on the edge of Tabitha Corsica's group. She was talking seriously, her pretty face lit up in the candlelit candlelight and the deepening light of the dusky ceiling do people ever get i don't know sorted wrong is it possible that the hat could make a mistake and put somebody in the wrong house hagrid sat down heavily as he uh, on a nearby bench making it groan appreciably well i can't say i've ever heard of it happening before he said some people may not like where their place but that doesn't mean it's not a good fit. It might mean they just aren't happy with who they really are. What, what is it you're worried about, James? Oh, it's not me. I'm thinking of James said hurriedly, taking his eyes off Ralph as so as to not implicate him. It's a, just a sort of, you know, general question. I was just wondering. Hagrid smiled crookedly and clapped James on the back, making him stumble half a step. Just like your dad, ya, yeah. always looking out for other people when you ought to be watching your own step. It'll get you in hot water if you ain't careful, like just like it did him. He chuckled, making a sound like a loose rocks in uh, in a fast river. The thought seemed to bring Hagrid a great deal of hearty pleasure. Nah, the Sorting Hat knows what it's up to. I expect everything will come out right. You wait and see. But as James walked back to his table, making eye contact with Ralph for a moment as he passed through the rooms, he wondered. What do you think? Do you think that a the sorting hat can be wrong? And I'm not crying, by the way. I promise. <laughs> My eyes watering. <laughs> it's um, just emotional. Okay. I don't think the sorting hat is wrong at the time. They pl- he places someone, it places mm-hmm. someone, but I think over time when a person's personality, ideals, um, and loyalties change, um, it may seem like they should have been sorted elsewhere. Mm. Like, I, I agree with Dumbledore when he says that he feels we are sorted too soon. Oh, um, yeah, he did say that. Yeah, um, because throughout life we always change, we grow, we we grow wiser, some faster than others. <laughs> it um, almost seems like there should be a like an undergraduate 
and then I graduate like like the first three years you're just like mixed between houses or but like just put all together and then you have your sorting and you're like the beginning of your fourth year or something like that I could see if they do like a, a sorting in your first year and then a, a resorting in like your your fourth year, um, or or maybe uh, at the beginning of each year the entire school is sorted, but that would make the sorting go forever. <laughs> that would be terrible logistics for whoever has to do the the housing and the <laughs> and yeah the class it, it would be it would be yeah but but um, I like um, the idea of you know, like some kind of second go. I don't know. I yeah. I know for me, I, I, I know it would be Slytherin for you every time, right? Yeah, every single time I've taken the test, I've gotten Slytherin. However, I I was already like in my twenties when I started taking the test. Um, when when it was available via Pottermore. Um, right. So if I had taken the test when I was eleven or twelve then I probably would have got a different answer. I probably would have sort been of... Hufflepuff. May, I yeah. might have gotten Ravenclaw, maybe. Yeah. I, 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 I would probably would have been Ravenclaw or or maybe Gryffindor somehow. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of people who, who uh, are always – they take the test multiple times to get the house that they want to be in. Yeah. And I always tell them the first time you take the test is, is the, the correct response, correct answer. Um, because. You're going with your uh, gut. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're going with your gut. You're, you're answering the questions for the first time. So you don't have any um, prejudices towards the, the goal. Uh, you're just doing your best. Whereas every time you retake the test, you mentally have a map out of where possible answers will lead you. I found myself like looking at some questions that, you know, if you're a Potterhead and you, you know, you just constantly in the, in yeah. the war, you can see, eh, I can see how that's a Hufflepuff answer yeah. or that's a Slytherin answer, you and, know? And so I had to make sure even the first time I took it to take myself out of that mindset and say, no, exactly. What would be my answer? What would exactly. I actually do? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then it made, you know, it made sense. And I actually did redo the quiz. Uh, I think when you, I did it in Pottermore and got Ravenclaw. And then I, when they started wizarding world, I did it and I got, I can't remember if they, Maybe in the Wizarding World, at some point, you were able to do it twice. They let you redo it. I don't know. At some point, I got well, Gryffindor, and they said currently on, on the Wizarding World, you can re reset the test as, as often as you want. I think you, you can want. only do it twice total, though. Okay. I think I don't know. That's I guess the rent. I'm happy. But yeah, so I went. I was Ravenclaw on Pottermore, and then Gryffindor. But they let me choose Ravenclaw. You know, they said, "Ooh, it looks like you might yeah. be Gryffindor, but do you want to keep your old house or do you want to go with the new one?" And I was like, "Yeah, stick mm -hmm. with my old one." You know, and so I was like, "But I felt kind of cool." It's like I got a Gryffindor though. <laughs> but I can't <laughs> you know. You're in the cool so, kids club. Yeah, yeah. I was like in the cool club yeah. for a minute, and then I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go sit at that table." <laughs> I like. I'm gonna it's go talk about sort time. of interest. It's sort of interesting the way they do it in the Hogwarts Legacy game. Apparently, um, uh, in the game, you can either uh, just straight up choose which house you want to go to, just straight up. Or alternatively, you can link your Wizarding World account with your Warner Brothers account. Ooh. And if you sign into the, the game with your Warner Brothers account, your house and wand on Wizarding World are the house and wand you get in the game. Oh, that's awesome. I like that plan. Yeah. So, yeah, so if, if you want to take the huh? Yeah. So if you want to take the test, you do it on the Wizarding World app and then you get that in, in game. That would be really cool. What is your Patronus? Do you have you done the Patronus quiz? I have my Patronus is a Rottweiler. Oh wow. Yeah, you're gonna be protected. So, so not just generic dog, 
It's literally Rottweiler. Rottweiler. Well, mine is a fox. So our patrolmen could could you know trap through the fields together at night if they wanted to. <laughs> yeah. is, was it was it a uh, uh, cunning like a fox or something? Was it? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. very Slytherin esque. Uh yeah, <laughs> yeah, very. Um, my mom was upset. She got rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, very american <laughs> right yeah it was funny because um i told i was reading up on things and i just realized that it looks like i had wings coming out of my head <laughs> <laughs> right tinkerbells um, fly behind you <laughs> yeah uh but she got rattlesnake and she was upset and i said well it's it's protective it's supposed to protect you so that would be a good protector she's like no i don't oh. like it <laughs> mm. um what's your one what's cool my grandmother a week after her calico cat died, it was an older cat, you know, it died. Um, she yep. got calico cat when nice. she took the quiz, and it was a week after that cat had died. It was crazy. It was wild. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Crazy. What's your wand? I have an ebony wand with a unicorn, unicorn hair core, and it is 14 and a half inches, I think, 14 and a quarter, maybe. That's a big wand. It is. It's, it's a long one. My one, I uh, can't remember exactly the length of it, um, but I can get that. Just give me one sec. That one. Uh, it's a uh, redwood and phoenix tail feather. Um, redwood, like the gigantic right. trees. Yeah. Neat. Um, and I try to go to the website. Do it. Damn it. Yours is very like fiery you like have redwood and then the phoenix tail feather core and mine is like literally black and white like ebony and ivory <laughs> ebony and unicorn hair no no um himalayan whisker yeti whisker core no nah, no himalayan yeti whisker core no <laughs> no um duh, 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 duh. Uh, profile Yeah, my wand is redwood phoenix tail feather, uh, 13 inches, and supple flexibility. Nice. Oh, mine is, um, I think it was, uh, flexible. I don't know. You, you gonna have me looking it up too. <laughs> I can't remember the. I remember it wasn't. It was like somewhere in the middle. I know when Kim took hers, she was Gryffindor with a salmon Patronus. Salmon. <laughs> a lot of people get very upset when they get the salmon because that's like getting magic up. <laughs> yeah, it, it was like what? Wait, like getting what? Magic up the the Pokemon. All it does there is it flaps around and splashes. But then you know oh. the Pokemon. Oh oh, magic. Yeah yeah okay. Magic up the, the the Pokemon. The little the, the yeah okay. I the only Pokemon I've ever done. I used to play. Pokemon Snap on Nintendo 64, where you were on a little yep. cart and you just took pictures of all the Pokemon. With a... Okay, here we go. We are Ravenclaw, Fox Patronus, Wand is slightly yielding flexibility. Okay, so so it it yields to your um uh or yields to you whatever you want it to do, it's going to do. Hmm. I nice. think that's that's the way I um yeah. Uh, okay. I so remember Rottweiler. Sorry, you go. I was gonna say I remember when Bellatrix lost her wand to Harry. It hers was like it 
whatever the word is for does not bend at all. Like, I can't remember what word they used, but her yeah, like, um, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. The only thing that's coming to mind is Rigid? inflexible. Rigid. Uh, Something like that. Uh, What'd you say about the Rottweiler, though? Um, uh, hang on. Uh, Rottweiler, this is a calm yet confident dog that allows its environment to influence it. People with this Patronus are hard workers and protectors. With a Rottweiler Patronus, you are you will always be protected from Dementors. Wow, that's pretty cool. So that leads me to a question for our viewers. Tell us what is your house, what is your Patronus, and tell us about your wand. Leave it in the comments section down below and hit us up on Facebook and let us know. Um, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your wizarding self. We want to know. <laughs> it would be interesting, very interesting to know. I'm sure there's a lot of people with uh, some interesting um, mixes. Yes, lots of diversity out there. Yes, exactly. Well, I think it might be that time. So do I. Yeah. It's yeah. good talking Lunch to time. you. Lunchtime. It's yes. been good. It's been a, been a while since we got, got um, uh, had our last chat, you know, with uh, uh, illnesses and work and family yeah. and oh, it's crazy. Yeah. All right. Hi. Have fun. I'm going to bed. Yep. I am going to go have some lunch. Enjoy. See you later. Bye-bye.